Good afternoon and welcome to this one hour webinar on personalizing analgesic dosing with the nociception level monitor. I am Frank Overdyke up here in the middle, uh, professor of anesthesia from Charleston, South Carolina, and I'm the consultant medical director for medicines. I'll be moderating this discussion. We have some, uh, I will start with a five minute introduction to nociception monitoring and the PMD monitor. Uh, from MediSense. We have some distinguished faculty with us today, who you saw there a, a few minutes ago, who will take about 10 minutes each to share their thoughts and experiences with the nociception monitor and this null monitor. Then we will follow my introduction with, uh, they will follow my introduction and we will conclude with 10 minutes of your questions at the end of the hour. So, our job as anesthesiologists is to take care of three domains of general anesthesia, analgesia, hypnosis, and muscle relaxation. The first domain to get an objective monitor was muscle relaxation in the 1970s, developed by Hassan Ali and his colleagues in Boston. And it, it's still an extremely important monitor today when we measure intra-op and PACU residual paralysis. Then in the 1990s, we got the depth of anesthesia monitor, the BIS monitor is shown here, which was also developed in Boston. Now, although some of us were skeptical, we needed a depth of anesthesia monitor. Most of us have come to appreciate the BIS monitor as a very useful adjunct to general anesthesia in special cases, if not all cases. But the domain that remains a challenge is to objectively measure intraoperative pain. And uh, then to titrate our analgesics, two in the OR. Most of us take great pride in using our training and experience to titrate opioids, but uh, to be honest, we don't always get it right. So before we talk about null technology, we need to review some uh, terminology because the definitions are very specific. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Notice the words unpleasant, emotional, and potential. This definition implies that pain is a subjective experience and can only, measure it be, can only be measured in the awake state of consciousness. So the correct term for an intraoperative monitor is not a pain monitor, but a nociception monitor. Nociception is the process that encodes a noxious stimulus from a nociceptor. So not all pain is nociception and not all nociception is pain. For instance, the pain of losing a loved one does not involve stimulus of a nociceptor, but is emotionally painful. And similarly, uh, the man you see on YouTube walking over hot coals has a lot of stimulation to nociceptor, but does not experience pain. Now, as you all know, there's at least a 30-fold variability in patient, uh, intrapatient variability in their response to a given dose of opioids. If everybody on this call got 10 milligrams of morphine, some would barely notice it, while others would be heavily sedated with a low respiratory rate. So in spite of our best efforts, we do occasionally underdose and overdose opioids. On the left, you see the consequences of underdosing opioids, unstable hemodynamics, hypertension, tachycardia, as well as postoperative pain, makes for prolonged PACU stays, poor organ perfusion, unhappy patients, and potentially longer term consequences such as chronic pain and opioid dependence. On the right, we have the consequences of overdosing opioids, the most serious being my academic interest, respiratory depression, as well as hypotension, opioid induced hyperalgesia and other less serious side effects. Nausea, vomiting, alias urinary retention, pruritus, we are all familiar with all the side effects. Uh, and of course, these patients may stay in the PACU longer. So we know pain and nociception activate the sympathetic nervous system. Pupils dilate, breathing and heart rate picks up and blood vessels constrict, sweating occurs. So the null captures signals from several of these sympathetically activated organ systems, the peripheral vasculature, the heart and the skin. This is the transducer. It looks a lot like a bulky pulse oximeter transducer. It measures four signals, the photoplethysmograph or the PPG, which you're all very familiar with, measures the amplitude, the pulse rate and the variability. 
It measures galvanic skin response, which is a fancy way of saying uh, it measures skin conductance that changes as the body sweats. It measures temperature and movement through the accelerometer. These last two do not contribute to the null score, but help assess the signal quality. And from these parameters and the derivatives, other parameters are derived, which contribute to the score. So how does the null index score, how is it verified and validated for these input signals? A clinical study was done with patients having general anesthesia using fentanyl and remifentanyl as the analgesics in various types of surgery. The stimuli that were measured with the monitor were varying intensity. So we had the highly painful stimuli such as intubation and trocar placements. And then we had stimuli of low intensity such as skin sutures. The, in the inputs were the proparameters and the derivatives. And the output was the ability of the null score to discriminate between high and low intensity stimuli as measured by the receiver operator curve you see on the right. So how well could each of these input differentiate between noxious and non-noxious stimuli, which was a dichotomous outcome. And what you can see here from these single parameter inputs, a skin conductance, pulse amplitude, that they could not reliably discriminate the intensity of these stimuli. Heart rate and heart rate variability, they do a little better. You see the, the purple curve and the green curve over here. But the best results came from the synergy of combining all these inputs into a nonlinear classification model. Nonlinear because it uses a machine learning algorithm called the random forest algorithm. And that had an area of the curve of 0.97. There's a very nice white paper that describes this. So the user sees this display, my apologies, not that display, this display, uh, which shows a continuous signal of the plethysmograph in the top left, as well as skin conductance, which is a flat line here, but you'll see some skin conductance and the absolute value, which ranges between one and a hundred. Higher values indicate a stronger nociception response, Null trend above 25 for more than one minute may indicate the patient requires additional analgesics, as you see in this box here. Null between 10 and 25 represents an appropriately uh, suppressed physiologic response and adequate analgesia, as you've seen in the green box. And then we have null below 10 for more than one minute. During a painful stimulus may indicate excessive antinociception. And you may want to reduce your analgesics at that, uh, at that time if possible. Of course, if you're going fentanyl, you can't take the fentanyl away. We're talking about a TCI or a, a T, uh, total venous anesthesia with a remedy fentanyl, where you could turn the concentration, the flow rate down with the target concentration. So the value proposition for null is uh, quite extensive. The monitor allows personalized analgesic dosing, responding to actual sympathetic output from the patient to noxious stimuli as opposed to using our typical doses in our experience. This is especially useful in patients at risk for overdosing or underdosing, such as opioid tolerant patients or the very frail or elderly. Now, you can imagine that the null is the perfect for helping you assess whether a regional or nerve block is working and dosing properly. So it helps you confirm adequate analgesia during multimodal techniques ERAS protocols, or even uh, opioid-free anesthesia if you're so inclined. So our first speaker today is uh, Dr. Mark Barley, a consultant anesthetist at the Nottingham Hospital in England. He is the area lead uh, for the NHS National Trust. He's also the honorary secretary for the Society for Intravenous Anesthesia. And you've seen him in the top right of the corner of, of this presentation. And he's a renowned expert in process EEG monitoring. Good afternoon, Dr. Barley. Hi there, thanks very much. And thanks everyone for joining us uh, um, in the afternoon. So uh, thanks for that kind introduction, Frank. Uh, a few uh, declarations as ever. Um, Frank's been through my, uh, asso my associations. So uh, one of the things that really changed the way I think about anesthesia was this diagram I found in Miller's textbook some years ago that showed me that anesthesia was a dynamic process with a 
alteration in surgical stimulus that proceeded during the uh, operation with multiple different points of stimulus. With intubation, the passage of the endotracheal tube being vastly more stimulating than really many of the other things we do. And that one of the things we do when we deliver a TCI-based anaesthetic is it's almost like we're flying over these mountains in our aeroplane, titrating our drug doses to the stimulus that we have in front of us. But what evidence do we have for these multiple changes in um, hypnotic and anti-nociceptive drug as we fly our patient over the planes of surgery? Thinking that the anaesthetic is a totally dynamic state with a change in um, stimulus applied by our surgical colleagues. Well, we need to remember that anaesthesia is, of course, a balance between drugs which cause immobility, drugs which cause unconsciousness, and a multitude of different analgesics, which may be both uh, opiate-derived and non-opiate, depending on our, our uh, technique and whether or not we've applied regional blockade to the case. For years, we've been well served with uh, hypnotic monitors of hypnosis, processed EEG monitors, and increasingly um, quantitative neuromuscular monitors, which are becoming a standard, certainly in the UK. And it seems odd that we take so much interest in monitoring the brain under hypnosis, but we've ignored nociceptive systems. So how do we judge how much opiate to give intraoperatively? Well, we can use our clinical expertise and custom. We can use cardiovascular parameters and the PRST. We can look for, uh, uh, we can use physiological uh, or pharmacologically derived systems, which are perhaps complex and not able to be used in, in real time. Or we can just stick with custom and practice, dialing up a remifentanyl effect site concentration of four, five, six, or even higher. Or maybe we could apply some science. Frank's already showed you the impressive area under the curve achieved by the null monitor, but it's interesting to look at how different parameters perform to a noxious stimulus, be that tetany or laryngoscopy. And here we see the very little change between incision and intubation in heart rate or mean arterial pressure, or even when using the bispectral index. These parameters really aren't particularly useful in discriminating against a noxious stimulus applied to our patient. The null seems to perform very much better with a statistically significant increase in null value when a noxious stimulus is applied. The drugs we use all work in a, a different range of receptors and pathways to induce the anesthetic state. An interesting observation is that as we increase the amount of opiate we uh, give to our patient, so we see the EEG slow down to a delta dominant EEG as we see at the bottom, and this is plasma um, effect site concentrations of sulfentanil. Now, propofol and our volatile agents work in the brainstem, the thalamus, and up into the cortex to produce particular EEG findings. We find ketamine at low doses produces uh, an increased frequency of oscillation in the uh, cortex and some slowing down in the brainstem. The opiates, of course, work in the spinal cord, brainstem, and in some parts of the thalamus and the insula. These drugs cause our EEG to change in multiple different ways. And indeed, the BIS monitor, as shown by this uh, black dotted line, isn't particularly good at discriminating between a noxious stimulus because it's a monitor ultimately designed to titrate hypnosis. It doesn't really pick up those changes in delta oscillation. And I'll show you a case where we've used ketamine and the null simultaneously to tease out the effect of ketamine, which can confuse simple index based systems. If we're looking with a little more detail at the process EEG, there's broadly speaking three forms of EEG arousal. The paradoxical delta arousal, which after a stimulus causes a slowing of the EEG. The EEG value on your monitor may well fall with this, although a noxious stimulus has been applied. Alpha dropout, where we lose power in the alpha band transiently, typically associated with intraabdominal stimulus, vagal stretch, for instance, this with a pneumoperitoneum being formed, and beta arousal, beta act, um, which occurs following a stimulus where we start to see a higher frequency of oscillations. This would be associated with an increase in your um, EEG value. But these are challenging to interpret and difficult to quantify. And this is where a nociceptive monitor can be really very helpful. So let's whiz through some clinical cases. This is a gentleman who I had the privilege to anaesthetize twice, just three weeks apart, once using my clinical acumen and once using my nociceptive monitor. And this is a density spectral array. And you may well have heard in the literature about how 
patients with a low alpha power are perhaps more um, predisposed to having post-operative delirium, alpha power here in this lovely thick red line. What I've done both times is essentially my same anaesthetic technique, a TIVA, TCI effect, uh, psych concentration system using remifentanil and uh, propofol. I've used the null to allow me to titrate my remifentanil to the null value here, and I've able to preserve my alpha power. Both times the patient's having broadly similar surgery. On the left here, a microlaryngoscopy. On the right, a panendoscopy, which proceeded into a laryngectomy and some seven or eight hours of surgery. The null enabled me to confidently optimize my remifentanil doses and preserve my alpha power. And at some points during this part of the operation, I was able to get really very low on my um, remifentanil concentration, down to one or two uh, nanograms per mil effect site using Minto, where I would be normally typically without that guidance running at four, five plus. We can see here the thicker pink band of alpha power on my Narcotrend system that I'm using as a processed EEG monitor. And this is what the case looked like on the null. So following a stimulus from intubation, we settle down into the doldrums of positioning and our surgeons getting ready. And this point here is where I'm able to decrease my opioids. I've increased them in advance of a painful stimulus, uh, uh, introducing the, uh, the panendoscope, and I've been able to maintain my null value persistently below 25, as indicated by the blue line. And I was confident with my opiate dosing here, and this patient woke up beautifully after seven or eight hours of TCI. Uh, controlled anaesthesia. Another case here, Noel enabled me to uh, make sound decisions again about my remifentanil dosing. Here where I was able to reduce my opiate at this point here, regain my alpha power before surgery started. We can see the null spiking with intubation, uh, descending down to um, very low levels with minimal surgical stimulus. An artifact in positioning is, of course, in the UK, we have anaesthetic rooms and we move our patients from one room to another. So some movement artifact will increase the null here. And then I've increased my opiate prior to the stimulus of surgery. I mentioned ketamine earlier. Ketamine, as many of you know, if you use process EEG, will, of course, produce um, beta frequency oscillations when given at low doses. And you see that on the process EEG as these higher frequency oscillations. This may well cause some confusion in your index based system. If you're using a BIS, pushing the BIS index value into the 70s, there or thereabouts, before alpha power is regained and the numbers drop. This can be quite confusing for an anaesthetist to manage, but look what happens on the null. Here we can see where I've administered my ketamine. My null value falls down to a very low level, which is commensurate with the effect of the ketamine, reassuring me that my anaesthetic is just fine and my level of hypnosis is, of course, appropriate. I find that the null assists me with pharmacodynamic opiate dosing rather than just using pharmacokinetics. Here we can see where I've applied a five second tetanic stimulus to the patient as form of calibration and optimized my opiate dosing prior to knife to skin. Every blue arrow is a point where I have made a change to my opiate delivery. And I make far more changes and fly my patient above the peaks and troughs of surgical stimulus with far more accuracy with the null than I would do using my conventional um, clinical skills. So I find that the null enables me to deliver personalized anti-nociceptive dosing. It allows me to visualize the pharmacodynamics of the uh, drugs I'm using and to understand the pharmacokinetics so I can deliver personalized hypnotic and anti-nociceptive dosing for my patients. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mark. That was excellent. I had a, a one question, actually, it's a two-part question for you. You said the, the BIS monitor does not detect nociceptive stimuli, but we, don't, we know from experience that the, the null uh, picks up a uh, level of consciousness on, upon emergence. A little bit. How do you how do you manage interpreting the null and the and your narcomed on emergence? So that, that's a great question. So I think there's a number of things to think about during emergence. So the first one being what reversal agent have you used? So for instance, if you use neostigmine and glycopyrrolate to antagonize your neuromuscular block, 
then that will cause an increase in heart rate, which will cause the uh, null system to indicate a, an increased value because heart rate is used as one of the parameters. And that's to be expected. That's simple pharmacology and predictability. What I do is I look at the null value prior to extubation. And I'm interested in getting a null value below 25 before the patients are, before I'm even thinking about extubation, because that assures me that I've got reasonable antinociception on board. Um, I extubate my patients. I use TBA TCI, so it's a fairly stress-free extubation. And to be honest, I'm not really too worried about the null value around the time of removing the endotracheal tube because with the best will in the world, that will always uh, cause a small degree of, uh, of, of stimulus. I used to run remifentanil during extubation but uh, because I do a lot of ENT surgery, but I found better ways of, uh, of stopping patients from coughing. And I think rethinking the way you extubate patients in the first place is, is probably the way forward. I just wait till they can open their eyes to my voice, then immediately remove the ET tube and we continue the conversation as we, uh, as we finished it in the anesthetic room beforehand. It sounds like you are very happy with your null monitor as, as an adjunct to guiding your anesthetic. I think it is. I think there's a wonderful editorial from Jamie Slay that says no monitor is an island. And I think we, we as the anaesthetists, we are, uh, our, our role is to amalgamate information from multiple monitors simultaneously to come up with uh, a, a clinical picture and to deliver the best possible personalized care. Excellent. Well, thanks very much. Our next speaker is adjunct professor, Dr. Roberta Manzani. She's the Chief Anesthetist for Surgical Day and Non-Operating Room Anesthesia at Humanitas University in Milan, Italy. She's also the Chair of the European Society's uh, Committee on Ambulatory Anesthesia. And her philosophy and approach to current anesthesia day practice is very aligned with this topic, which is we can do better to administer the right anesthesia. Dr. Monzani, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you also for the presentation. I speak to you today uh, about uh, the use application of null in uh, bariatric surgery. I want to share with you our philosophy because we married ERA's philosophy and we choose a bariatric surgery and uh, we mm, define an anesthetic protocol. Before to have this protocol, we read it, all the guideline and the good clinical practice of our scientific society, surgical and anesthesiological. Then we decide this finally protocol. If you can go back, please, we can show, stop here. So you can see our anesthetic Arabs protocol. Uh, we choose a, a protocol opioid sparing and the multimodal analgesia approach. In this slide, uh, you cannot read that uh, we uh, use and we touch on to the surgeon to perform a tap block uh, before the beginning of surgery. Why the surgeon? Because the surgeon can has a, a very good uh, direct vision and can perform a perfect tap block. So we share with our surgeon this, uh, this moment. You can go on, next slide please. So how null can help us? We want, uh, we have a protocol. For us is the best protocol to treat our patient, but we need to, uh, to try to know and objectivate our choosing. We want to know if uh, our choice uh, of uh, pharmacological uh, uh, therapy and the moment when we administer these drugs is the best that we can do for our patient just to have the less post-operative pain. Second objective is that we want to understand when we have hyper on the hypoalgesia during intraoperative period. So we are using not correctly opioid or other type of analgesia. Uh, we can have uh, in the post-operative period, a NRS score higher. Then we want to understand because we know which are the steps more painful for our patient point of view anesthesiologist and point of view surgeon. But we need to object also this 
thinking. So we need a monitor and NOL can help us to understand if our thinking is correct. Next slide, please. So another point is that we need to know the NRAs of our patient, all our patients, because we need to know the perception of the, our patient. So we ask about NRAs before surgery and after surgery. So we want to compare and try to understand if something is changing and why, and if our choices intraoperative for drug and other action are correct for the treatment of this patient. Second, we want to know the association between null indices and postoperative pain with NRS scale. So if I have a very high value, null value, intraoperative, I can expect a very high NRS score during the postoperative period, we want to know. Then identify the most allergenic phases I told you before, and then uh, know if we have a very poor control to pain intraoperative, we want to know if all the events can be correlated during all the step of this path of care. Next one, please. Practically, we collect data, but we start, we begin in the preoperative period with a, a very excellent history taking of our patient because we need to know also all the comorbidity of this patient. You know, sometimes these patients are on chronic pain and chronic opioid therapy because they suffer from fibromyalgia, arthrosis, neuropathy, etc. Level of specific painful analysis of null indexes every 10 minutes because we want to compare with this score. Also, because we need to know that our patient is under an adequate hypnosis phases during all the surgery. And then NRS, we collected immediately after surgery and during the first and second day. Why immediately after the end of surgery? Because these patients tell us they have a very important pain in the middle of the thorax and is a visceral pain. So it depends on the technique, surgical technique. We can uh, try to feel better the patient if they wake up and walk a lot. So if they move. The movement is a partial solution for this type of pain. And also because the movement is a solution for POMB, post-operative nose and vomiting. Next one, please. If we analyze this graphic, this is a woman 39 years old, BMI 39 underwent severe gastrectomy, surgery duration one hour. You can see in the first phase, induction general anesthesia, intubation, uh, position of gastric tube, and performing tap block, we have a very high value of null. So here we wanted to do something and think something with a null value just to ameliorate the situation. After we have a suppression, then we have another spike. Here we are in the middle of the surgical time, then suppression, and the last phase, before the last phase, we administer ibuprofen 600 milligrams IV. So the last phase uh, with uh, skin suture, we have uh, a variation, a little spike for no value, but uh, all the average of null value is, is acceptable. At the end, we have the extubation and the awake of the patient. All the time, these patients are very agitated, so we have a very high spike. Next one, please. So how null can be integrated? I told you before, we married with Eros philosophy. Eros philosophy is teaching us that we need to treat our patient in the time that we, uh, we have to find the best solution for their health problem. So in this case, we know that we are doing all 
what we can do all our best. But one of the underestimating problem is the post-operative pain. And also the literature is saying this to us. So drug titration specific protocol can help us to avoid the hyper and hypoalgesia. The effect of an incorrect therapy you can see in, uh, in the table below, and we know that the result is delayed post-operative recovery. The next one, please. So what uh, we are thinking to change in our protocol after the use and the application of the null intraoperative period. We want to change the administration of para paracetamol uh, before the beginning of surgery and not intraoperative because we want to ameliorate the first time you remember the high value of null during in, uh, the induction of general anesthesia. Then we wanted to, to introduce a local anesthesia in truth with lidocaine spray before video assisted intubation just to ameliorate this maneuver and uh, Last, we wanted to try to share with our surgeon to perform tap block at the end of surgery, just because we wanted to uh, collect the data from the pain before, uh, at the end, I'm sorry, at the end of surgery. We want to ameliorate, ameliorate also that phase that the patient arrived in recovery room. So I think we have some road to do, but with the help of NOL, we can ameliorate our protocol. Now, just a few minutes to share with you another point of view, another application of NOL, not under general anesthesia, but in a weight patient. The next one, please. In this case, you have an hernia repair surgery in a man 53 years old, hypertension and MRGE. The local anesthesia is performed from a surgeon and we administer a very light sedation and uh, uh, in continuous uh, IV, we have remifentanil in a very low dosages. The next one. In the graph, you can see the, that the, is very different, the graph, from the other one under general anesthesia, because here the patient is awake, but the range of the value of null is very acceptable. We have just uh, some spikes, but very, very thin, that are that, uh, recorded a very high value of null. Local anesthesia, skin incision, and then in the middle of surgery, we administer ibuprofen 600 milligram high B. The next one, please. Uh, I have another one in the middle, but don't worry, I can speak about it. So uh, another thing that we need to remember is that in this uh, type of surgery, the surgeon needs the collaboration of the patient. So sometimes he has to do the patient to cough just to control if it's adequate the technique surgical. So, in my opinion, we need null, we, and null can help us to do the best choices for our patients. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Manzani. That was fabulous. I just had a quick question for you. So, if I understand your goal, uh, you are using uh, null to help you evaluate the effectiveness of your multimodal analgesia interventions. And you chose bariatric surgery, which is a surgery where we're all concerned about sleep apnea and all these other things. Which is other surgeries would you think that you would go to next in establishing protocols using all? I think general surgery because uh, it is the surgery that has a more volume of activity and the more volume of patient. And now we have a lot of geriatric patients, so frailty patients. So I think is uh, very useful to have null to tailor our choices for analgesia, multimodal analgesia. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. Um, and lastly, uh, we are delighted to have a surgeon present uh, as part of this webinar. <clears throat> Thoracic surgery requires a delicate, precise, and skillful technique. 
And Dr. Zardo is, is exactly one of those thoracic surgeons whose team has used his null for uh, during intrathoracic lung surgery, but in non-intubated patients, which uh, for us as anesthesiologists is very interesting, always gives makes our null values shoot up when we're dealing with sedated patients and somebody who has a scope in the, in the chest. Uh, he and his anesthetist colleagues have integrated null monitoring into the protocol and he'll share his, his experience with us now. Dr. Zara. Yeah, let me share the desktop first. Thank you, Frank, for the kind introduction and um, for the opportunity to allow me to bring the surgeon's perspective into personalized anesthesia. Um, I need to, let me see. Yeah, there you go. Well, if you ask me what my perspective is, uh, you can see it on this short footage. This is what we do every day. What you see is a procedure on the left side of a patient who undergoes a lung resection. And nowadays we do everything by VATS, which is uh, vita assisted thoracic surgery. And in this special case, uh, you can see our standard approach, with it, which is uniportal VATS. That means that you need just a single incision for the entire procedure. And even if it, this seems like a minor incision that shouldn't put too much discomfort, but shouldn't, shouldn't offer too much discomfort for the patient, we do know as surgeons, as thoracic surgeons, that all incisions you make into the chest are amongst the most painful ones. So, Every single thoracic surgeon should, should be aware of this and try to behave accordingly. And on the one side, there's what we surgeons want, which is certainly in the first place, personal comfort. We want to have a nicely deflated lung. We want to have a good view over the entire surgical field. And we want the patient to move as little as possible. Of course, there's the issue of patient comfort. We don't want the patient to have any kind of post-operative pain any kind of nausea and vomitus. We want the patient to be satisfied with the entire procedure. That means he should have a short postoperative stay and should return home and overall well-being. But the crucial issue still remains the patient's safety, which is the absolutely central issue in every single procedure. That means in oncological patients that you need to perform a radical resection without entering into any kind of compromise. What is that we as thoracic surgeons to expect from the anesthetist? Well, we want a nicely isolated lung, and that is the case for conventionally intubated patient, but also in patients that are um, undergoing surgery in non-intubated fashion. We want surgical field stability. That means that the patient shouldn't move in any kind. That's quite easily done in conventionally intubated patients, but it's a far more challenging matter in patients under spontaneous breathing. We want in every case, in every single case, a good analgesia, which depends on the good intra and also postoperative management. And we also want a certain measure of understanding. That means that the anesthetist should be aware of the kind of procedure we are performing and manage everything intraoperative accordingly to the extensiveness of the procedure. On, earth, on the other side, there are also certain things that we as cardiothoracic surgeons need to know. I already briefly addressed this. We know that lateral thoracotomy is the most painful surgical access in man. And this is also the case in a less, to, to a lesser degree for conventional video assisted procedures, which are certainly the second most painful incision you can do. So there's a certain part of the job we need to take over. We already talked about multimodality and multidisciplinarity, which are absolutely key in treating, treating a patient. And to achieve this, there needs to be also a certain measure of understanding from a surgeon's point of view on what the anesthetist is doing and how the measures we do can complement with whatever is happen happening on the other side of the drape. This means we need to be aware of different regional strategies, know how a power vertebral blockade can be performed from the inside of the chest, maybe an intercostal nerve block, always doing a regional block as well, and also being aware of how systemic opioids work in the patient. So what will this imply for us? You already shortly addressed the fact that um, I wanted to talk about non-intubated uh, 
anesthesia or non-intubated lung surgery. Uh, from a historic perspective, the first vasculobectomies were done in the early 1990s in Milan in Italy, which is now 30 years ago. And the first non-intubated unipotal lobectomy was done by Diego Rivas in Spain eight years ago. He visited us together with his anesthetist Cesar Bonom, and we performed the first non-intubated lobectomies in Germany four years ago and started the whole program. And what does this program look like right now? Well, we agreed on a multidisciplinary management. The first thing was to set up the surgical access. We try to perform every single pro uh, procedure nowadays by uniportal VATS. We will let the patient inhale some lidocaine prior to the procedure because we know that this will help us once we need to um, pass a bronchus during surgery to limit movement. Every single patient requires regional anesthesia. This is still to a certain degree a thoracic epidural, but it's more and more replaced by paravertebral blockades and erector skin plane blocks. We need a lean monitoring, which includes an ECG, non-invasive blood pressure measurement, oxygen saturation, and just two small venous cannulas. That's the anesthetist part. Our part is to perform a local anesthesia in every single patient. And when it's required to do a paravertebral blockade from the inside, we will always do in major resections a vagal blockade. What this looks like, I will shortly show on a, on a video. Sometimes we also do a phrenic nerve blockade in certain patients. We then perform the resection, but absolutely key remains the communication between our surgeons and the anesthetists on the other side of the drape. So what does the anesthesiological management look like? Like I told you, there's a lean monitoring concept in our OR. The lidocaine annihilation was already mentioned, as well as the regional blockade, the approach by uniportal VATS, and in patients that will undergo a minor procedure or simple major procedures, we will work with dexmedetomidine, with O2 insufflation, local anesthesia, and EEG monitoring. Sometimes we will have to work with sulfentanyl boli and with a vagal blockade, and then more complex anatomic resection in patients with a lot of comorbid comorbidity, like those undergoing lung volume reduction surgery, sometimes on patient request, sometimes in patients with obstructive sleep apnea, we will do what we call a deep sedation with spontaneous briefing, sometimes still with the adjunct of a laryngeal mask with EEG monitoring. We still work with dexmedetomidine, sometimes with propofol and with a bugger blockade. And what does this look like in our theater? Well, you can see us working in our OR with two monitors. And as you can see, there's always a lot of interaction going on between the anesthetist on your left-hand side and my surgical team on the right-hand side. They're sometimes still toying around with their cell phones, but they're mostly keen on washing the patient. You can see that the patient is lying in a lateral decubitus position. He's awake. And as you can see, the, the interaction going on is the recommendation to utilize a bit more of local infiltration, which is always useful, even the patients undergoing conventional procedure under complete anesthesia. As you can see, the patient is awake, you can freely communicate with him. He will try to rest in a comfortable position for the entire duration of the procedure. Now you can see us beginning with the entire procedure by entering the chest cavity. It's the right side. You can see the upper, the middle, the lower lobe. You can see there's a lot of movement going on, which is the crucial difference between conventional and non-intubated lung surgery. What we are doing right here is a local infiltration. You can see a cannula entering the chest for which we can inject some ropivacaine in the intercostal space and do a paravertebral blockade on, under direct visual control. There's a lot of emphysema. I'll try to skip a bit ahead. You can see the superior vena cava, the trachea, the phrenic nerve. And what we do here right now is the vagal infiltration, which is absolutely crucial in our patients because once you enter in contact with the bronchus, there will be a lot of movement going in in your surgical field if you do not address this before, before this. As you can see, we dissect everything with a harmonic scalpel, dissect 
the pulmonary artery, past the pulmonary artery, and then transect everything with the staping device. It's our suction going through to see if everything is clear, the stapling device. Then we transect everything. And then let me skip ahead to the transaction of the bronchus, which you can see right now with a green stapling device. And even though we transacted the bronchus, there was little to no move movement of the patient, mostly thanks to the vagal infiltration I already showed you. Let me skip ahead a bit further. The last part of the procedure consists in um, transacting the, the parenchymal fissure so that we can remove the entire specimen through a bag. And as you can imagine, it's still one of the most painful parts of the procedure for the patient because you have to remove the entire lobe, which is huge, especially in patients with emphysema for a very small incision. And that's certainly still one of the major pain triggers during our procedures. So what can the role of Noah be in these kind of procedures? Dr. Monzani already told us about her experience with uh, awake patients, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about as well. As you can see, we have very acceptable levels of null, and you can see spikes here in the null level every single time the patient is directly addressed. This leads, of course, to movement and will accordingly lead to a rise in, in, in the null measurement. But what you can also see is a very nice trend over here with the patient that was already received it's thoracic epidural in this case with some artifacts and a rise a spike, which is due in this case to a reduction to a decrease of his Dextor medication. And once this has been realized, it will increase the Dextor and the null measurement will drop again. The interesting thing is that the patient directly after the procedure reported to not have experienced any kind of pain and he told us it's that his level of pain was of one or two on the visual analog scale, which is a really nice result for this kind of procedure. So what can we say about the role of null in modern thoracic surgery? Well, the first point is that null appears to be feasible even in awake patient, which, which is kind of interesting because that's not what it was originally designed for. And it can allow us to perform objective pain measurement, which is useful for us in teaching from a surgical point of view to teach the right technique of local infiltration of paravertebral blockade. But it's also very important for us to teach young anesthetists because we have a large number of um, younger uh, anesthetists coming through our OR to learn the, the um, techniques of lung isolation, which in turn will help us to improve the quality of care. And then also offers us certain opportunities in research in monitoring the progress of our ERAS program, in testing novel devices like a virtual reality headset, which is implemented to help us distract the patient during procedure, uh, devices like prior NB, which allows us to perform cryogenic nerve ablation, which will help us in pain control and will stop any kind of pain up to six months after the procedure. And which, of course, is a very nice tool for us to, to, to toy with. So at this point, we can already say that we have quite a vast experience with minimal invasive procedures, which are absolutely key in helping us prevent pain, that at present we can um, innovate further by even being less invasive by foregoing um, a total anesthesia, and who knows what the future holds. Thank you. Dr. Zardo, that was fascinating. Thank you very, very much. Um, I, a quick question for you again. It appears that you and Dr. Manzani have that uh, same use for null, which is in evaluating the adequacy of your regional blocks, in your case, thoracic epidurals and paravertebral blocks during the case. But as you mentioned, um, your patients are um, sedated, they're awake, they're not in general anesthesia. And as you correctly said, the algorithm was derived from patients under general anesthesia. But what was fascinating is you said your, your patient's uh, pain levels, and these are now to my earlier definitions of pain and nociception, it looks like pain and nociception are pretty much aligned because you, you were testing this in, in these kind of patients. 
So uh, it's fascinating that you, that you have enough confidence that you're developing a, a body of knowledge around that deeply sedated or sedated patients who can give you both an object, a subjective and an objective measure of pain. Um, what's, uh, is that, am I interpreting that correctly? Absolutely. And it's totally fascinating because originally we were approached to implement null in um, conventional thoracoscopic procedures. But um, I asked then if there was any previous experience with patients undergoing any kind of weight procedures. And um, I was told that experience does exist, but it's still very limited. So this prompted us to, to, to try out this, this entire procedure. We saw that once the blockade, either the thoracic epidural or the combination of a paravertebral blockade, a regional blockade, led to a drop in null, which initially told us that um, the, um, the quality of our analgesic procedure is high. And then in the next step, during the procedure, we could observe that once the hypnotic drugs were decreased, over a certain period of time, the, the null level did increase again, which prompted us then not to to be prompted by nociceptive um, events, but by a rise in all to increase the level of the, the hypnotic drugs, which is really fascinating. I'm no anesthetist in any way. So um, my, my primary intention is to, to learn something about the, the body of work of anesthetists and maybe even try to, to help the teaching in the initial phase of the anesthetist entering our war for the first time and for the first time experiencing this kind of procedures, which certainly is a benefit for, for both sides and should be one of the main features of a university hospital like ours. Well, we're delighted that a surgeon would take the interest in the anesthesia. We certainly take interest in surgery. And uh, thank, you, thank you so very much. Uh, I'm looking for if we have questions from the audience, but while I don't see any on the chat room, I had a question for Dr. Barley real quick. Uh, Mark, you, you, you mentioned that you saw, we saw some, what is the risk of using the null monitor? You showed us during, there was some movement, the null went up and, and during heart rate changes. But what, what, what is really the risk uh, of patients using it, of, of a clinician using a null monitor? Um, so I think providing we understand the way our drugs work pharmacologically, then uh, I, I feel there's, there's very, very little risk and only benefit, to be honest. I mean, any drug that increases heart rate is going to uh, elevate the null index exactly the same way it's going to elevate the heart rate on your ECG. Uh, and we need to think about using the null with its five different parameters as a much more accurate way of, of assessing our nociceptive anti nociceptive balance than our conventional cardiovascular parameters that we use at the moment. So uh, I don't see risk, I just see benefits. Okay, yeah. So what you're saying is basically within our training and our conceptual understanding of how the monitor works, we understand that a tachycardia may make it lead to an increase in null value and may not be associated with that. And that's also the, the purpose of the accelerometer and stuff in terms of movement that may make the, the null go up, but you can interpret those appropriately. Uh, Dr. Manzani, I wanted to ask you the same question. What is the risk of using the null monitor for you versus benefit? You're on mute, Dr. Manzani. I'm sorry. There we go. For me, I don't know if we can have some risk. Uh, we need to understand the result and, and to interpret it because we can have some events during surgery and then we need to understand if knowledge is helping us to understand. Not all the time. The index of null is the only one score that we can just look. We need to have a global vision of a patient. So we need all the complete monitoring. This, null, TOF, and everything we can have to monitor the patient. So all this monitoring can help us to do the best for the patient. So you don't see any downside, any, any risk? No, but we need to understand very well and to know very well the technique. Great. And also the monitoring, to, to know we the have monitor. A... Excellent. Thank you. We have a couple of questions on the chat uh, from Michael Tucci. Why would you use dexamethasone after surgery and not before? Why not benefit from the early, earlier anti-inflammatory uh, effects, especially during laparoscopic surgery? 
maybe Dr. Zardo wants to address this because he writes pre-op orders. So uh, we use dexamethasone after only in the cases when we have an actual score. We use actual score to classify the, the POMV risk of a patient. So if during the preoperative history taking, we found a very high HAPTRA score, we administer before surgery. In other cases, we administer after. And the other, after, yeah. Okay. If, if, it's, if it's necessary, not all the time. It's all not right. a, our big problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, from Marco Scharf, we have a question, paracetamol. How long before the start of surgery can it be used as a pre-anesthetic around 45 minutes before the start? And there's different ways to giving it, of course. We have IV paracetamol as well, but I, I presume we're talking about paracetamol in general. Uh, Dr. Barley? I tend to give my paracetamol intraoperatively. Um, you can give it preoperatively, but it doesn't really contribute to uh, anesthetic effect, really. Uh, it's just part of the bag of multimodal analgesics, isn't it, really? So it's a fairly standard medication for us in the UK. Okay. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, anybody have any other questions that I see on the chat or on the Q&A? I don't see any at the moment. So uh, on, on the whole, well, this is, we're coming to the top of the hour. I'd like to thank our audience. And of course, I'd like to thank our uh, excellent faculty uh, pioneers in nociception. Continuous nociception monitoring, in my view, is long overdue. As Dr. Monzani so nicely said, it's really part of that triad that we need to solve. And we look forward to more uh, exciting breakthroughs in improving pain management and making our patients more comfortable. So I'd like to thank all of you. Fascinating presentations, and hopefully we can do this again sometime. Have a great afternoon and a great evening.